So, my friends, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So I'll come directly to the point. Some of you will end up being ambulance chasers. Some of you may wind up in the Supreme Court of the United States. But whatever you do, I warn you, don't become a law professor. <laughs> if you do, the same terrible thing will happen to you that's happened to me. At the end of every six years, just when you're beginning to get into your stride and are enjoying your work, you're handed a reward. A vacation with pay for a whole year. They call it a sabbatical year. In leaving you, I leave not only my students, but my friends. I shall miss you. And you, I shall miss most of all. In the year since you graduated, I've kept in touch with you. It was a great joy to me to visit your offices, help you with your first cases, to sit in with you occasionally in court. Now, for a whole year, I shall be out of it. I suppose you will survive. I'm not so sure that I will. Goodbye, my friends. Goodbye to you all. time a man should start on the leave of absence right after rigor mortis sets in. Well, you won't mind it once you get on the boat. Now, that's what I dread the most. Paul, come home with me, will you? Perhaps you can help persuade my wife that we can have a wonderful vacation right here in town. I'd love to, John, but I've got a court hearing at 11. Well, I'll go with you. Perhaps I could be of assistance. Oh, no, thanks. Your wife would never forgive me if I took you away on the last day. I'll see you off at the boat, though. So long, Professor. Goodbye. Habeas, here's a job for you. Mm. Thank you, Habeas. Jerry, why are people continually traipsing around? Why is some other part of the world more interesting than the part you're in? You haven't had a day off in seven years. You've got to renew yourself. Now, look, Jerry, why couldn't I renew myself without going away? No. We could have a wonderful time together, you and I, right here in town. Oh, no, John, if we stayed here, you'd be over the school every day telling the dean oh, how to oh, run No, things. I wouldn't. Oh, yes, you would. Or you'd be at the offices of your graduates telling them how to run their no, offices. No, I wouldn't. I'd stay home with you, darling, all day long and renew myself till I was blue in the face. Oh, oh John. <laughs> oh, please, now. Let go of me so I can finish packing. I will, if you let me help you. Oh, now, John, mm -hmm. please. Go away and let me pack. Well, where shall I go? Go to a movie. They're playing Snow White down the street. Well, I saw that Monday. Oh, see it again. Well, well the theater doesn't open until noon. Where will I go until then? Take a walk. Window shop. Your pocket. Hmm? What? Oh. Oh, John. Mm. Oh, you've burned the pockets out of yeah. almost every coat you own. Oh, now, please, get out of here before you set the house on fire. Yes, dear. What is it, Mr. Roberts? Hello, police department. Somebody just threw a stench bomb in my theater. Send a, you better send over a lot of police right away. Tell Austin to get pictures and the story, and I don't want any alibis. This is my brother-in-law, Mr. Tom Ross. Uh, he's the managing editor. He'll do something for you. This is Mr. Roberts. How do you do, Mr. Roberts? What seems to be the trouble? Well, I... Uh, well, uh, Mr. Uh, Roberts runs the University Theater. He's the victim of a vicious conspiracy. Outrageous. What happened, Mr. Roberts? Mr. Ross, You know, I... you made a mistake when you signed up with the Theater Owners Protective Association. And the moment he did sign up, Tom, the other outfit started to make trouble. What other outfit? Well, you see... Well, the Theater Owners Mutual Aid Association. They started to throw stench bombs. But the first outfit objected. So, threatened by the second outfit, they... Now, wait a minute, John. Suppose you let Mr. Roberts tell me his story. But I don't want to talk. Then what's the idea in coming here? Because he insisted. I haven't anything to say. I'd rather have stench bombs thrown in my theater than dynamite bombs in my home. Well, 
If Mr. Roberts won't give you the facts, then I will. I'm going to see this thing through. Oh, for heaven's sake, John. You act as if this was the first stage bomb that was ever thrown. Now, how can you say that, Tom? There was a panic in the theater. People might have been hurt, maybe killed. Well, what do you expect me to do about it? Well, headline it. Uh, get some action. Be your rage, John. There's nothing we can do about it. This town is infested with every conceivable racket. They pay no attention to the law. What would one headline more or less mean to him? Well, something ought to be done about it by somebody. Why, this poor man... Why... He's gone. That's fine. Now, if you get out of here, maybe I can get some work done. Go tell your story to the governor's civic committee. Just drop in there. You'll hear about rackets that'll make stench bombs smell like violets. Where did they meet? The state house. Wait a minute. You're not really going there, are you? bet I am. But I was only kidding. It's a private meeting. Intimidation of witnesses has made it impossible for the grand jury to get anybody to testify. Corruption and bribery have sabotaged this investigation from the start. The governor has threatened to call out the militia. Not only that, but I have information the federal government intends to take a hand unless we show some results. It's up to you, Mr. District Attorney. It's always up to the district attorney. Well, what have you done? The governor authorized the appointment of a special prosecutor. Why hasn't one been appointed? For the simple reason that I can't find anyone to take the job. Can you blame them? What man in his right senses would step into a spot like that? when the district attorney himself admits that he can't cope with the situation. Gentlemen, the uh, shortest distance between two points is a straight line. I've been listening to you now for over an hour. Really, aren't you making a mountain out of a molehill? How did you get in here? I walked in. Who are you? Well, my name is Lindsay. I am a professor of law. I think I have a good grasp of the situation. I'm sure that you don't need any state militia, federal men, or outside help of any kind. I quite agree with you, but since this is a private meeting... Oh, I don't mind that at all. New York had trouble like this and cleaned it up. Now, I'm sure we can do the same thing. After all, who are these racketeers that you've been talking about? They're a very low order of people, from all I can gather. While you, gentlemen, well, you have everything in your favor. The forces of law, money, public opinion. Now, I'm sure that if you tackle this problem in a scientific way, uh, that you can... Uh, Sergeant, would you kindly inform this gentleman that this is a private meeting? All right. So, uh, I'm afraid I was in the wrong. I had no business intruding. After all, I'm only a taxpayer, and everybody knows taxpayers have no rights. Oh, Professor. Hmm? I'd like a word with you. My name's Eugene Ferguson. My son was one of your law students, graduated a couple of years ago. Not Paul Ferguson? Yeah. Well, I'm delighted to meet you. Yeah. He's spoken to me about you a great many times. <laughs> Not half as many times as he's spoken to me about you. He thinks you're the greatest authority on law in the country. Well, I think he's the best student I ever had. I predict a brilliant future for him in the law. Well, that rates a drink. Oh, and I rarely indulge in the afternoon. Well, it's almost evening. Yes, but your meeting. Oh, they can get along without me. Hmm? If they won't listen to you, I will. You know, the right man could step in and clean out the whole nest of them in 30 days. I know just the man, but unfortunately, he's going away on a sabbatical leave. You mean me? Why not? Well, of course, if you've made all your plans to leave. Mr. Ferguson, I'll make a confession to you. I consider it no hardship to postpone my trip for a few weeks. A few weeks? Yeah. Come now, Professor. It may take longer than that. Oh, no, no, it wouldn't. Oh, I know. You probably look forward to your vacation for a long time. Well, Mr. Ferguson, I have an awful fear of an ocean trip. Two more, Emil. Of course. <laughs> I don't know how much the job will pay. Well, uh, that doesn't interest me in the least. The university pays my salary. You know, the mere sight of a steamer funnel makes me ill. Well, I'm sure I could sell the committee. They've got to find somebody pretty soon. I get seasick just thinking of a steamer. Smell anything burning? Hmm? <laughs> oh. <laughs> we don't have to worry about the state militia or the G-men. I've just landed a fish that'll swim downstream. I'm glad to hear it, for even we can't cope with the G-men. Kitchell, I've got a special prosecutor that'll fit right into my vest pocket. Call the boys together and tell them we have nothing else to worry about. Don't be excited. You've got plenty of time. There's plenty of time. Ten minutes. Mrs. Lindsay, perhaps the professor is waiting at the house. No. no, he called me at seven and told me to meet him at the pier. He was with Paul Ferguson's father. Said he was having dinner with him. Paul, did you see your father? He isn't home yet. Well, did you try the office? He isn't there. Oh, 
the shore, look for in the shore. Now, now, Jerry, don't be worried. Oh, I'm too worried to be worried. If he isn't dead already, I'll kill him when I see him. Oh. Hello, everybody. Um, well, my dear, I have a great deal to tell you. Yes, I have a great deal to tell you, too. You know, most curious chain of events this morning. You know when I left to see Snow White? Yeah, I know, the Wicked Queen. Now, you That's come on, right. before they pull the gang tank up. You can tell me all about no, the boat. Wait a minute. That's just what I want to tell you. We're not taking the boat. I'm afraid we're going to have to postpone the trip. What? I've been drafted. He'd like to speak to you. Oh, thank you. Hello, Dad. They just told me you were in here. Hello, oh, Paul. Paul, I wish you'd consulted me before you accepted this position. Oh, I wanted to spring it on you as a surprise. I thought you'd be tickled to death. I'm not keen about your going into politics. Well, this isn't politics, Dad. It's a job. A swell job. It's a dangerous job. If you fail, it's a mark against you. If you succeed, you're a target for trouble. Well, if you feel that way about it, why did you recommend Lindsay? Lindsay isn't my son. You're all I have, Paul. You've got a nice law practice, and I can help you a lot. And I think I can fix it with Lindsay to let you out. No, 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 Dad. Listen, Dad. I've enlisted for the duration of this war. We're going to clean out the rackets, all of them, from the top to the bottom. Quiet, please. We're on the air. Come on. Take pleasure in presenting the newly appointed prosecutor, the Honorable John Lindsay. This is the first, and I hope the last time I will address you. The motto of this country used to be millions for defense and not a cent for tribute. But something alien and un-American has come along and tried to change that motto to millions for tribute and not a cent for defense. I'm addressing myself not only to victims and potential victims of rackets, but to the organized mob of criminals who've not been in the and taken over your government. I hope that some of them are tuning in, because I think we should all understand each other. The racket started as petty larceny. Hey, mister. They're big business now. My name is Gerard. How do you do? What's the idea of refusing to install our slot machines here? Why, I told you, man, why? We have a high school across the street. This is no place for gambling. Come on, quit stalling. I want an order to install some machines today. Well, you won't get it. Well, get out of here. before the grand jury because you've been threatened and intimidated. Now, if you, who are the victims of these rackets, won't cooperate by offering frank and complete statements, how am I going to make any headway? I'm sure you want to help. Maybe we're not thinking of ourselves. Maybe some of us are thinking of our families. I've got a wife and two children. Last week, I tried to take out some life insurance. I was asked if I intended to testify I was told that if I did, I couldn't get a policy. Uh, what's the name of that uh, company? The Acme Insurance Company. Acme Insurance Company. Well, we'll see about that, Mr. Uh... Butler. Butler, thank you. Brophy, Mallet. Gentlemen, these men are detailed as my bodyguards. Now, I'll be glad to assign them to the first one of you who will agree to testify. They'll act as your bodyguards day and night. I'll assign two men to anybody else who testifies. Now, surely that should remove your fears. That'll do, boys. Are you gonna knuckle down to these crooks, or will you help us fight them? All right, gentlemen, you're excused. Simpson, you have the names of these men who were just in here, haven't you? Yes, sir, I have. You must have dug them up from under a stone. But they were the list given us by the grand jury. Well, I want you to get me a complete set of their books. 
But how am I going to do it? Mr. Simpson, how long were you employed in the district attorney's office? Six years. Well, didn't you learn anything? Every time I ask you to do something, you ask me how. You're supposed to be an assistant around here. You know what an assistant is? One who assists. To assist means to help. I know, but under the law... Are you trying to teach the law to Professor Lindsay? Well, no, sir, but in order to get the book... I'll show you how to get them. I'll have them here inside of 24 hours. Yes? Mr. Simpson calling. All right, put him on. Hello, Simpson. Mr. Kitchell. They're going to grab the books of those witnesses. All right, Simpson, I'll call you back. Hello? Yes? Uh, thanks. Who was it? Simpson. He says a couple of Lindsay's men are out looking for me. What goes on here? Oh, yes. I took care of that. I thought somebody ought to tip Lindsay off to get in touch with you. We got him his job. It's time we were using him to help us clean up some of the riffraff. Boys like Con Cronin and his bunch. All the undesirable elements. You know something? When we get this thing organized, it'll be a recognized industry. People who get used to it, and the money they pay will come under the item of overhead, like uh, insurance. <laughs> you mark my words. Someday, we'll be listed on the stock exchange. Well, where's Miss Ballou? Disappeared. She must have left town. Left town? I can't understand this. Whenever I send for people, they always leave town. How do you explain that? Do they know when I'm going to send for them? Well, I don't know, Mr. Lindsay, but we looked high and low for her. Searched every inch of the town. Yes? That's Frankie Ballou. Send her in. Hello, boys. Looking for me? Yes. Have a seat, Miss Blue. All right, boys, you can have the rest of the week off. Next time I want you to find somebody, look behind you to see if they're following you. The next time you want to see me, just call. I'll be right down. Well, thanks for the tip. You know, I'm uh, sort of a greenhorn in this business. Oh, that's all right. You won't be in it long. What's that? I said you won't be in it long. Unless, of course, you start to get busy and prosecute some of those nasty racketeers. You know, I'd really like to prosecute a few. If I could only find any to prosecute. Intend to go after me? Oh, no, 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 not at all, Miss Ballou. Then what do you want me for? Oh, well, uh, just uh, what is your occupation at the present time? At the present time, I'm listening. Yes, I know, but uh, what is your training? What do you do? Oh, a little of everything. Oh, Jill of all trades. Uh-huh, and mistress of none. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hmm. Have some candy? Candy? Oh, now that's no way to get fingerprints. Wait a minute, let me see. There. There. If you want something, just ask for it. Well, thank you. I'll try to remember. I suspect you're a very intelligent young woman. <laughs> I know my way around. I don't. I'm afraid that's the trouble. You'll never get anywhere chained to a desk. You know, if you're going to throw people in jail, the least you can do is to meet them. Well, I call that invincible logic. I know where quite a few of the bodies are buried. How would you like a personally conducted tour? I'd like nothing better. If you could spare the time one evening, well, I'd be... Well, how about tonight? Tonight? Mm -hmm. What, you mean that? Mm -hmm. Well, I... Oh, well, it can wait. Yes. Uh, get me Mrs. Lindsay, please. Uh, uh, tell me, do we, uh, do we dress? Oh, no. Most of the joints are informal. Hello? Oh, hello, darling. Uh, I'm afraid I'll have to beg out dinner tonight. Yeah, you work every night this week. This will take a minute or two. Anyway, I'd like to see a little idea myself. I forgot to uh, like. uh, Yeah, yeah, sorry, dear, but it has to be done tonight. I don't know what I'll do. I'll yes, well, you must remember, I only have 30 okay, days. Every night you work. It, it's most I'll important. Well, well, I'll call you later. The best wife in the world, but a wife. Good evening, Miss Glow. Uh, two, please, Jimmy. Uh, this way, please. Hello. 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 Who, uh, who protects this place? 
Count Cronin? Well, we seem to be devoting ourselves to Cronin Enterprises exclusively tonight. He's got the cafe racket pretty well sewed up. You want to see me, Gerard? Is it all right if I buy the proprietor another place to drink? I don't drink. Well, let's uh, sit down. I want to talk to you. Uh, baby, your nose needs powdering. I get it. Oh, by the way, that reminds me. I promised to call my wife. Please excuse me. Why, sir? You yeah, got a nice place here, Martin. I uh, hear you make two grand a week profit. I don't want any trouble with you, Gerard. I don't need protection. I made a deal with Con Cronin. Oh, that's too bad. Too bad, Marty. You got a nice place here. You know I'm in the wrecking business. Hiya, Frankie. What's the idea of patronizing one of Colin Cronin's places? What about you? I'm here on business. So am I. I was uh, just talking to Martin. Yeah. You know, I think we're working this thing all wrong. Instead of taking the places away from Cronin, we ought to take Cronin away from the places. I uh, think I'll hang around here tonight. When Count Cronin drops in, I'll... You do nothing of the kind. We don't want any rough stuff here tonight. Did you see the man I came in with? Huh? That's the Honorable John Lindsay, the man who's going to clean up this town. With what? With our help. Listen. We don't need any help. Orders, Eddie. Here he comes. Well, there was no answer. I suppose Mr. Lindsay is retired. That means you won't have to hurry home, huh? The morning is ours. <laughs> Here's to a long morning. Well, may it be as instructive as the evening. You know, I've learned a lot tonight, thanks to you. You've learned practically everything I know, mm. except the Big Apple. Oh, yes, the Big Apple. You know, that's always been one of my secret ambitions. <laughs> but I don't believe I'll ever get to hang oh, it. Oh, sure you will. You were swell in the last one. Was I? Yes. Well, you know, someday when I get time... No I... time like the present. What you mean right now? Why, certainly. Come on. You know, I really feel sort of guilty with John at the office, up to his ears in work. I don't. Sorry you're the goat, but this is going to happen every time he misses supper at home. Oh. Oh, miss? No, miss? Come on, Paul. Now, Jerry. Yes, and this is my assistant, uh, very much my assistant, um, Mr. Paul Ferguson. How do you do, Mr. Ferguson? How do you do? Oh, pardon hmm? me, uh, your table is right over here. Oh. Do you mind if we join you? Oh, no, 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 not at all. You, you sit right with us. We'll all sit together and have a nice party. Oh. Well, I didn't expect you here. <laughs> Paul, I didn't know the professor could dance so well, did you? No. It's as much of a surprise to me as it is to you. Really? Well, now, wait a minute. Now, I give you my word of honor. I've never danced the Big Apple before in my life. Well, he learns we... quickly, Mrs. Lindsay. He took to it like a duck to water. <laughs> Your husband's just full of rhythm. So you've noticed? Hmm? Oh, cream? Uh, uh, yes, a little. Hello, Mr. Cronin. Is Frankie Ballou been here tonight? She came here a little while ago. Anybody with her? Yeah. An awful hard-looking ape.
Hello, Linky. Oh, hello, Con. I want you to meet my friend, Mr. Lindsay. This is Con Cronin. Glad to meet you, Mr. Prosecutor. Well, the pleasure is mutual. We were discussing you earlier in the evening. Yeah. My ears have been burning all night. Uh, this is my wife, Mrs. Lindsay, and uh, my chief assistant, Paul Ferguson. Ferguson? Any relation to Eugene Ferguson? Father. Well, well. You know, I'm glad I ran into you tonight, Mr. Lindsay. Well, so am I, Mr. Cronin. Uh, won't you sit down, Mr. Cronin? Ah, oh, it's a pleasure. Oh, it's fine. Oh, thank you. I've been very anxious to get in touch with you. Yes? You see, I run a legitimate business. All my clients will tell you so. But I've been having a little trouble lately with some of these imported hoodlums that are trying to move in. And they're not going to get away with it. Make a note of that, Frankie. I certainly will, Con. Does anyone here have a piece of paper? Yes, I think I have. Well, this is all very interesting, Mr. Cronin. You'd be surprised at the setup in this town. And you'd be surprised, too, Mr. Ferguson. I'd like to make an appointment with you in your office tomorrow. Well, I keep uh, open house at my office. Anybody who wants may walk in. Con, let's dance. I'd love to, Miss Ballou. All right. I'll see you in your office tomorrow, Mr. Prosecutor. I'll expect you, Mr. Cronin. All right. Want to take a tip from me, Cronin? Leave town tonight. How can I do that when I have a date in the criminal courts tomorrow? <laughs> be a mistake for you to call on Lindsay. Oh, I'm not going to see Lindsay. I'm going to see his assistant, Paul Ferguson. My Paul. I think maybe I can get him to see the situation a little clearer than Lindsay. Understand? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I understand. I want to know where you dug up Miss Ballou. She looks like a Greek goddess. She is a Greek goddess. And she came bearing gifts. Beware. Now behave. I've been playing babyface all night. The trouble with some people is they think they know it all. I know a little something myself. A little knowledge is a dangerous thing, Carl. Not if you use it right. You know, I can't understand the sudden burst of cooperation. First the young lady, and now Mr. Cronin. But I'll know more about them before another day is over. Murder at cafe as prosecutor dances Big Apple. Big Apple. A murder committed right under your nose. No wonder we've had complaints. Well, I assure you, Mr. Leander, it was all in the line of duty. I think it would be more in the line of duty if you made some arrests and got a few indictments. Well, arrests and indictments will come when I'm ready. When you're ready? So I couldn't get anything out of the witnesses I sent for. And so we seized their books. But every one of them has erasures. The very people we're trying to help are the least inclined to cooperate. Yes, we're not getting any help from the Board of Supervisors. We need more funds to carry on the work. Why aren't we getting any? Lindsay, the reason they're holding up appropriations is because you're not getting results. Results? I think it's an outrage to put a man in a spot like this and expect miracles. We owe Mr. Lindsay all our confidence and support. As far as I'm concerned, he's got it. Thank you, Mr. Ferguson. Now, if you don't mind, gentlemen, I have a lot of work to do. Will you tell Mr. Lindsay Miss Ballou is here? Go right in. He's expecting you. Thank you. Hello. Oh, hello, Frankie. You know, you're the only man in the world that could get me up at this time in the morning. Oh, uh, pardon my appearance. I've been here all night working. That's what I call keeping your nose to the grindstone. Well, it's one way of keeping your nose clean. Oh. Sit down, Frankie. Did you notice those uh, three men who just left here? Why, yes. Acquainted with any of them? No. All right. You know Eddie Gerard? Eddie Gerard? Yes, think hard. I'm sure you'll remember. He was on the dance floor last night when Cronin was killed. Who was he? Well, you must have seen him. Well, as I told the police, I was dancing at the time. And I always dance with my eyes closed. Eddie Gerard came over to our table last night when I went out to phone. Now, what did he want? He thought I was a movie star and he wanted my autograph. Is that why you borrow that notebook from Paul Ferguson? 
to write your autograph. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Eddie Gerard killed Cronin, didn't he? Did he? Now, you know he did. And I know it, too. Well, if you know it, why don't you pinch Eddie? Because I can't prove it. Well, you can't prove anything by me. Matter of fact, I'm not interested in who killed Cronin. But I would like to know why he was killed. And I've got a hunch you know. I think myself that Cronin died of softening of the arteries. How that slug ever got into him, I couldn't tell you. Of course, when it happened, I yes, was dancing... Yes, sir, yes, I know. You were dancing with your eyes closed. Well, tell me this. Who's taking over Mr. Cronin's business? What business? Oh, I see you've been raiding the Daily Press morgue. Hmm? Oh, yes, yes. I spent a great many hours after I left you last night going over these clippings. And I was interested to find that you were in several of these clippings. Those were the days I was the little girl reporter. Yes, I see you had a byline. By Francis Ballou. An interview. And who do you suppose it's with? Oh, might be anyone from Einstein to Babe Ruth. Yes, it uh, might be Eugene Ferguson. He wanted to find out if I knew you or not, and he found out. He's been reading newspaper clippings and he dug up that old interview. Well, what does that prove? It proves he has a hunch. And so have I, Jean. He's a whole lot smarter than you think he is. He's so smart he can't get the Board of Supervisors to give him another nickel. He's on his way out right now. Mrs. Butler? Yes. I'm Mrs. John Lindsay. My husband's the special prosecutor. I wonder if you could spare me a few minutes? Come in. Thank you. Have a seat, please. Thank you. Mrs. Butler, I came to talk to you about our husbands. Well, I, I'll talk about my husband first. You know, I was very much opposed to his taking this job as special prosecutor. Aside from the fact that it interfered with the vacation, which I'd been planning for a long time, well, I felt the job was a difficult and a thankless one. To say nothing of its being a dangerous one. Yes. But since he took the job, well, naturally, I started rooting for him. Naturally. John has no political ambitions whatsoever. He's refused compensation from the city for his services because the university is paying his salary during his leave of absence. And as soon as this job is done, he's going back to his classes. That's why I came to see you. What have I got to do with it? A great deal. He can't very well finish this job without starting it, can he? And he can't very well start it if the very people he's trying to help won't let him. Like your husband, for instance. My husband has received death threats. But so has John. But he's not paying the slightest attention to them. Why should your husband? He has two good reasons. I'll show them to you. Uh, Tom, I've got the books of the Acme Insurance Company right here in front of me. I'm convinced that they make a business of breaking windows in order to sell insurance. Well, you promised to find out for me who controls that company. Keep your shirt on. I got it for you. And you won't like it. Ninety percent of the stock of the Acme Company is owned by Eugene Ferguson under a fictitious name. Eugene? What do you mean, Paul's father? You sure of that? Well, I'll call you later. Oh, and will you call up my father and tell him I won't be able to have dinner with him tonight? Thank you. Hey, John. What do you got there? The books of the Acme Insurance Company. Isn't that the company that turned Butler down when he applied for insurance? Said he was a bad risk or something? You want me to go over these Acme books with you? No, no, I'm quite able to go over these myself. You've been up all night, John. You better go home and get some sleep. You better get out and let me work. When I need your advice, I'll ask for it. Hello, Paul. Well, hello. Well, what 
did you do to your chief assistant? It looks as if somebody just proved there was no Santa Claus. Oh, what happened, John? Well, I've just gone over the books of the Acting Insurance Company. They've been doing a terrific business lately in plate glass insurance, and every policy on their books was applied for by the client right after he had his shop window smashed. Well, what's that got to do with Paul? Well, nothing, only that Eugene Ferguson happens to be the principal stockholder of Acme. No. Yes, and he's in deeper than that. He knows Frankie Ballou. I believe she works for him. Now, this is the trail I've been looking for, but how can I follow it? Maybe I ought to ask Paul to resign. Maybe I ought to resign myself. Oh, I was a fool to take this job in the first place. You were not. Well, haven't you been nagging me ever since to chuck it? Not chuck it. Finish it. Well, how can I finish it now? The cards are stacked. If I go after Ferguson, it'll wreck Paul. And I can't do that, Jerry. Why, he's like a son to me. Hello? Who is it, please? Oh, put him on. John, it's Mr. Butler. Well, tell him I'm not in. I broke my back trying to get those people to open up, and not one of them offered to help. But don't you think you should No, it's a it. waste of time. I'm not so sure about that. Yes, what is it? I've just had a talk with my wife. If you can assure me protection, I'd be willing to come to your office and testify. Assure you? Why, Mr. Butler, I'll guarantee you protection. Just hold on a minute. Yes. Let Paul face and come into my office right away. The things I'm going to tell you, Mr. Lindsay, will open your eyes. Well, that's fine. Fine, Mr. Butler. I'm sure you won't regret it. But look, I'll, I'll send a man, the best man I have. He'll be right over to pick you up and see that you get safely to my office. Paul, I've just heard from Butler. He's ready to testify. Now, you go right up to his house and bring him down here before he changes his mind. Sure. Come isn't... on, now. Get going. Come on. Jerry, I've done it, I've done it. Mr. Butler? Yes. I'm from Mr. Lindsay's office. Oh, he found you were coming. I'll be right with you. I'll come back as soon as it's over and tell you all about it. That's the right thing to do, and I'll be waiting to hear from you. Now that I've made up my mind, it's a kind of relief. It's a lot I've got to tell, Mr. Lindsay. I know just how you feel. Well, Mrs. Butler? Yes. I'm from Mr. Lindsay's office. I've come to take Mr. Butler downtown. Well, he just left with someone from Mr. Lindsay's office. Are you sure? Why, of course. They left just a minute ago. John, hmm? Butler wasn't there. What's that? He'd already gone. Some man who said it was from your office had come for him before I got there. My office? Yes. Why, we were the only ones who knew anything. Yes? Say, John, one of those witnesses who refused to testify was killed. His name's Butler. He was shot and thrown from a car. They just found him. Paul, they killed Butler. How could they have known him? Why, only you and I and Jerry knew that he was coming here. Nobody could possibly have known unless... Unless... Yes, unless... My staff. I want to see every one of you. Get in here, all of you. Get in here. Come on, hurry up. Now, listen to me. I sent Paul Ferguson to bring Butler to my office. Somebody got to Butler's house before Paul did. And now, Butler is dead. He was coming down here to testify. Now, nobody knew about that but my wife, Paul, and me. Until some stool pigeon in this office sent out the information. The grapevine started right here. Now, one of my own staff killed Butler. Staff. 
Uh, before I started this investigation, I should have sent for the street cleaning department and the fumigators to clean up the whole pack of you. You. You got shifty eyes. Don't like your face, never did like it. Yes, and you two flat-footed morons. I'd have done a whole lot better to get myself a couple of poodles. You're all a bunch of blithering, double-crossing incompetence with hookworms. I don't know which one of you sent out the tip that killed Butler, but I'm going to find out. In the meantime, you're fired, the pack of you. Come on, Paul. Hey, he can't fire us, Brophy. We're civil servants. Yeah. Hey, fellas. Uh, the professor will be with you in just a moment. Would you mind stepping in here, this room? Oh, no, sure. Come on. Let's make our way. Hello, Bird. Just the man I wanted to see. Who are those men? We don't know it yet, but they're my new staff. Fine youngsters with no strings attached, no political tie-ups. People I can trust. I've cleaned house throughout that rotten bunch that passed for servants of the people, kit and boodle. From now on, it's going to be different. Wait, John. There isn't going to be any from now on. What do you mean? I've just come from the Board of Supervisors. They blame you for Butler's death. They've clamped down on you. No more money. But they want me to quit? Listen, John, a man's a fool to butt his head against a stone wall. You know I want to help, but my hands are tied. All right, Bert. I'll stop butting. You have my resignation. I'm sorry, John. I know just how you feel. No, you don't. You don't know the half of it. Hello, boys. Hello. Let's say how I've dreamed of holding a reunion with my graduates, but I never thought it was going to be like this. Well, thank you for coming down. Uh, sit down, please. Right. Sit down. Gentlemen, the uh, shortest distance between two points, sometimes a very rocky road. You know what I've been up against since I've taken this job. Well, I haven't been able to lick it. I failed. You've all seen this headline. Butler was shot to death. Why? What did he do? What was his crime? Nothing. Who was he? He was just a man like you and me. He had a little business. He voted. He paid taxes. He had a wife and a couple of kids. And he took darn good care of him. He was killed because he was going to stand up and tell the truth. And I promised him protection. But I couldn't keep that promise because my office was infested with a nest of stool pigeons. And so I fired them and I sent for you. You were the best students I had, honor graduates. I brought you here to offer you that job. Well, that was a few hours ago. Since then, gentlemen, I have been fired. Fired? Fired, yeah, Professor? Yes, but I'm not quitting. I'm going to keep right on going as a private citizen. I took an oath over the dead body of Butler that I would smash the system that killed him and every man behind that system. I'm going to fight them with all the weapons I could find. They're owned if necessary. Fair or foul, above or below the belt. I'm going to lick them. Or else I'm going to wind up on a slab like Butler. But I need help to do that. I need you. I want you to come into this fight. Now, there won't be much money in it, and there'll be times when you won't be getting any. You'll have to be on the job 24 hours a day and every day. Now, I'm not hiring a staff. I'm recruiting a regiment. And if you enlist, it's for the duration of the war. Wait a minute, Professor. We, well, some of us can't. We're, we're working. What are you working at? What are we working at? What do you mean? Well, you ought to know, Professor. Law. Why, we're practicing law. What yeah. law? Well, the law is dead. I taught it to you, but it was all a waste of time. You won't be practicing any law until you bring the law back to this city. Professor, you can't lick that bunch. They hold us too powerful. They're, they're too strong. Yes, and getting stronger. Why? Because decent people in every community say what you're saying. They sit back and they watch organized crime eat away at the very foundations of their own government. They, you and I, we're to blame. Now, when are we going to wake up? 
When are we going to get fighting mad and call a halt? Why, we live in the community, don't we? Some of you will marry here, build homes, raise children. Now you want this a place for you to live in. I, for one, would rather be dead and out of it than go crawling through life, taking orders from the lowest and filthiest elements in our social strata. I'm going to fight. Now, how many of you are going to fight with me? I'm in. Count me in. I'm in. I'm in. Well, that's fine. Now, sit down. Let's get organized. Paul, have you the list of the loan sharks with you? Right here. Good. Now, gentlemen, we're going to need money to carry on this investigation. Don't worry, Tubby, this isn't a touch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to raise the money by borrowing it from the loan sharks. Loan oh, sharks? How do you that's know? a unique idea. I'm going to make them finance their own destruction. They did a business of $20 million last year, so they must have plenty of money. I want you men to go out and get all you can out of them. Rig up your own references. Yeah, but how are we going to pay them back? Well, don't worry about that. When it's time for them to collect, they can come and see me. Now, gentlemen, the shortest distance between two points is to have you boys help me pack up my files and records and get them out of this mildew dump. <laughs> come on! We'll get that And now, wait a minute, boys. That table belongs to the city. Oh, no. Good fishing today? Yeah. Swell. They're biting on everything. Here's a hundred. Here's two hundred. hundred and fifty. Well, bless their little hearts. I don't know what we'd do without the dear little loan sharks. Hello, Bert. Thank you for coming. I went to work the minute you called me. You know, I told you you could count on me for anything except money. Well, thank you. Is he my man? Yes, Inspector Gleason, Mr. Lindsay. How do you do, Mr. Lindsay? How do you do? Well, uh, tell me something about the inspector. He's one of the men who didn't toe the line with certain people. So he was transferred to the marshes with the goats. Well, good enough. Man after my own heart. Come in, Mrs. Butler. How are you? Oh, I just came over to tell you that I'm moving out of the city. Moving? But the business. There isn't any business. They haven't given me a minute's peace since my husband was killed. I want rookies, youngsters who are just starting in. I want you to pick them, check up on them, organize them, and hold them ready for me until I need them. John, please. Oh. Well, good morning, Mrs. Butler. She was followed by three men in a car. They're waiting outside now. I just saw them. What? Jerry, call up Tom and ask him to send a report and the cameraman down here right away. What for? Uh, do as I tell you. Inspector, would you mind stepping out and asking those three men to come in here? Paul, you go with the inspector. Hello. Hello, get me Tom Ross, quick. Tell him it's a scoop. Hello, hello, Tom. It's a scoop now. I don't know what it is, but it's a scoop now. Send a reporter and a photographer up here right away. And make it two photographers. Two photographers. Now, wait a minute. Come yourself. What's your hurry? Come on in, gentlemen. You're just in time for tea. Get going. I think that's everything, Inspector. Right. Now I want a picture of these three men. Well, that's a waste of time. You can get their pictures out of the rooms gallery. Yes, but I want a nice group picture. All right, boys. Yes. <clears throat> Close in there, fellas. Yeah, I'll it up a bit. Thank you. Now we'll call this one before. Later we'll take another picture. We'll call that one after. Now, uh, gentlemen, there's been a lot of bosh printed in the newspapers and pulp magazines, which has tended to create a false impression concerning the psychology of the hoodlum. They've been represented as men of desperate courage, exceedingly tough hombres. Well, I've always had an opposite point of view. Observe that they always come in groups, not alone. Observe that they always come armed with guns and other assorted weapons. Take note of the fact that it took three of these alleged guerrillas to terrify and intimidate one small unarmed woman. Unarmed and alone, I'm sure that their actual courage is on a par with their intelligence. Nil. Now, with the permission of the district attorney, I'd like to prove this with an experiment. It's all right with me. Thank you. I'd like to have this experiment photographed in detail, if you don't mind. Okay. You. Now, it's my intention to uh, beat your head off. Perhaps it'll be the other way around. Anyway, we're going to find out. You can't. Now, nobody is going to interfere. If you'll be good enough to move that furniture back a little, I think we'll have a little more room. Just a minute, just a moment. Just a moment, boys. My fault. 
I shouldn't have turned my back on him. All right, come on. a scoop for you and I want it on the street within an hour. The professor and one of the hoodlums are having a battle right now. After the professor gets through delivering a lecture on hoodlum psychology, he chooses one of the hoodlums. The hoodlum cops a sneak on the professor while he's taking off his coat and knocks him on his divan. Fight is yours. This professor with his left would knock him onto the desk. He picks the professor up and with a right cross knocks him over into the corner. Don't you think we ought to stop the pretty professor? Pretty well dead. Professor comes out and misses the hoodlum, but the hoodlum didn't John, miss the professor. He pops him right on the button, knocking him into Please. the crowd. The professor tears after the hoodlum and hits him with the right, which knocks him over into the French door. Picks him up off the floor and with a well put right, knocks him onto the desk. Give it to him, John! Give it to him! Left, giving the hoodlum a good crack. The professor was on him like a wild man. Come on. They're all off the desk, onto the floor. They're finish flopping him, right John, and left. Finish him. They're up. The professor Come on. him back to the floor. The hoodlum's on top of him. The professor grabs him and he's getting up with him. The professor might have bitten off a little more than he can chew. Right on the button and the hoodlum is out like a light. QED. Huh? Quote error demonstrandum. Has been demonstrated. Professor, can I take this one? Oh, no, this is my lecture. Professor chooses the next one, who shows no fight. So with a well-placed right, back, the professor knocks him cold. Seeing that both of these pals are out the third one tries to make a getaway. You've got to hand it to the professor. I got a good mind to make him a proposition. Get him into the organization. <laughs> Be a whole lot better to get your son out of Lindsay's organization, or else wise him up and get some good out of it. I'd rather throw the whole thing overboard than do that. Sure. Your chin isn't out like mine. I'm the one Lindsay's gunning for. He's using your son as a sharpshooter. Why should I be the patsy? He sweated Barrett and got Mrs. Butler to talk. Now, if I were running things... You're I... not. Don't get me wrong. I'm only thinking of your welfare. Don't worry about me. I'm going to lose any sleep over a screwball without an organization, without any money. He's lined up an organization and he's found a way to borrow money. You know where. By the way, Gene, the Acme books haven't come back yet, have they? What's Eddie Gerard doing these days? Memorandum to Paul Ferguson. Advertising newspapers asking all people who borrowed money from loan sharks to communicate with me here. Memorandum to Crane. Check on the list of forgery dealers and see which of them installed the Kitchell cost system. Memorandum to John Lindsay. Reminding him that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. You know, I've been trying to decide what racket I'd take up. What? So I'd get a little attention. I have been neglecting you, haven't I? Being neglected's all right, but well, you haven't even been seeing me. Oh, nonsense. I haven't taken my eyes off you since the day I plunked you in that law course. Yes, and I'll never forgive you for that. <laughs> oh, dear, if only I hadn't sent you out that day to see Snow White. Jealous of her? John, <laughs> you know, I went out and bought you a present today. What'd you get? You go and see. It's in the top drawer of that bureau. Oh, yeah. Over there? Mm-hmm. Well, why couldn't you put it in this drawer? Now, <laughs> you go see what it is. Go on. What you mean now? Yes, now. Yeah. Feels 
Heavy. What's this? Well, the next time you may not get a chance to disarm them. Well, aren't you afraid I might get hurt? Yeah, this is the closest I've ever been to one of these things. How does it work? Well, now you see that thing there? Yeah. That's for safety. It's on now, so you can't pull the trigger. That's right. See? Yeah, but when you push it down. What do you mean, like this? Yeah. Look out! Got away. Jerry, get Gleason on the phone right away. I'll need a couple of his rookies. Yes. Habeas, you're fired. Now, you chumps ought to know better than uh, busting a guy's place without a warrant. Yes, well, you'll have to excuse the boys, you know. They were only recently sworn in. They don't know the ropes yet. I guess you don't either. You're wasting your time and mine. I can prove by 40 witnesses I wasn't there. Where? Anywhere. What's the pinch for? Parking your car near a hydrant. <laughs> That's a good one. Mister, my car's in the garage. Come on, what's the charge against me? Mr. Lindsay, I think this guy's got a gun on him. Well, go on, take a look. Well, carrying a gun without a license. I got a license. Well, where is it? There you are. What's the matter with your hand? I suppose you shot it while cleaning this gun. Yeah, that's it. What's the name of the doctor who treated your hand? There wasn't any doctor. Well, who fixed up I your I did hand? it myself. Oh, practicing medicine without a license, huh? Take him along, boys. All right. All right, on your way. On, on your way outside. Go. You promised me an exclusive. Now, what have you got on Gerard? Murder of Cronin, murder of Butler, attempted murder of yours truly. We mustn't rush into print just yet because I can't prove it. Rush into print? You promised me tons of copy, and what have I had? When do we open up? When we close in. My new staff is doing marvelous work. They're accumulating plenty of evidence, but we're out for more. But, John, you ought to give the newspapers a little. They're yelling their heads off. Well, let him yell. The people are holding mass meetings, petitioning the governor, criticizing Barry for working with you. First thing you know, they'll take it away from you. Oh, no, they won't take it away from me. Now, get away from that waiting wall. I've got work for you to do. Work? You've got most of my reporters working for you already. Well, then hire some more. What for? Now, listen. Paul Ferguson has been checking up on Moss Kitchell. His office is a front. He gets together with his boys at his apartment. They hold a meeting there several days a week. What's that? Floor plan of an apartment. Kitchell's? Yes, and the one next to Kitchell's. Now, look. This is a closet. Now, the wall of this closet is the wall of Kitchell's living room. I was just wondering if it were possible to plant a motion picture camera in the closet of this empty apartment. I get it. I'll assign one of my best burglars to plant that camera for you. Not only a camera, but a dictaphone, too. We'll not only see him, but we'll hear him. Well, great. Now, send Austin in here, quick. Austin, see if you can shove it over now. That's swell. Look, Austin. Swell. Take a pen all over the room and see everything. That's fine. I want someone to stay in this room 24 hours a day. Yeah, but how about some food? Don't worry. I'll see that you get it. And all the film you get, I want you to turn over to Mr. Lindsay in person. Okay. Gentlemen, this situation is becoming dangerous. If the people aren't protected by the law, they'll take the law into their own hands. I must ask for your resignation. I'm sorry, Governor, but I refuse to resign. In that case, but I'm I need his help now more than ever, Governor. Mr. Lindsay, you've tried to do this job, but it's been too big for you. You failed. We haven't failed. We're all ready for the final push. We've tracked them down, every one of them. We know who they are and how they operate. We're ready to clean them out if you'll just give us a little more time. How much time? 24 hours. All right, Lindsay, go to it. Well, thank you, Governor. John, that was a good bluff. But I do know who they are and just how they operate. I haven't any proof. I don't care. I'm going to arrest every one of them. I want them all brought directly to my house. 
I don't want any of them booked or taken to a police station. But you can't pull people in without bringing charges against them and having some proof. Are you going to help me round them up? John, I've strung along with you all the way, but this is suicide. If you cause wholesale arrests and then can't back them up, well, we're not only washed up, but we're in line for criminal prosecution. Well, I don't care. I'm going to take that risk. It's going to be a pleasure to rot in jail if I can drag a few of the swine in with me. <laughs> suffer most. If you want to know why, come around to my apartment and I'll tell you. Apartment 317? I'll be there in 10 minutes. Bill Jones, Art Green. Lindsay, as I told you, no matter what he has on you, you'll never have a chance to use it. I'm taking care of that tonight. And after Lindsay's out of the way, I'll see to it that Paul leaves town. Hello. to look like suicide, but it wasn't. Kitchell was killed because somebody knew that I was coming to see him. He was killed because he was going to tell me something. That's why Cronin was killed. That's why my father didn't want me to work for you. That's why you wouldn't let me look at those Acme books. You wanted to protect me. You said this is a war. All right, everybody gets hurt in a war. Yeah, wait a minute. Where are you going? Tom Ross is in there. I'm going to tell the world how my father's mixed up in this thing. How he's posed as a civic-minded citizen when all the time he's been double-crossing me and the rest of the city. My own father, the head of this whole slimy outfit. I'll give Ross a story, a whole chapter. No, this is a close chapter. Oh, no, it isn't. Now, wait a minute. I'm still in charge of this job. If you're working for me, you're going to take orders from me. Oh, now, you've got to trust me, Paul. You're not going to say a word about this to your father or anybody else. Oh, you're wrong, John. I've got to get this out yes, of the office. Yes, yes, but not now. We're not ready for it yet. If those arrests be made today, can be made a stick, yes. But if they don't, it's we who are going to be behind bars. Now, go out there and work them over. Go ahead, break those crooks down. Mr. Lindsay. Yeah? We've got it. It's just what we've been praying for. Why, the day's film will blow the lid right off this town. And the record, too. Well, good. Let's run it. Well, Mr. Lindsay, can I see you? See me later. What opportunity I'm going to give you, men. What a story we're getting tonight, Paul. Yeah, what a story. I want to get my lawyer. Oh, I'll get you a lawyer. The place is full of lawyers. Take him in there. You carry on, Crane. I'm going to make these loan sharks talk. Coffee, Paul. Oh, thank you, Jerry. Helen, 
Coffee and sandwiches to the staff. Here's some coffee. Oh, what's the matter, John? Sit down, Jerry. Take some dictation. The last will and testament of Eugene Ferguson. Go ahead. I, Eugene Ferguson, being of sound and disposing mind and memory, and not acting under duress, menace, fraud, or undue influence of any person whatsoever, do make, publish, and declare this to be my last will and testament in the manner following. Is that all, John? John, I've got to talk oh, to you. Just a minute, Paul. Yes, that's all, dear. Get it out as quickly as possible. Yes, darling. It's hopeless, John. We can't break them down. We've got to get those witnesses to identify them. Where are they, on the patio? Yes, every man who refused to testify before the grand jury. Yes, every one except Butler. I'd better see them alone. Gentlemen, I'm glad to see you again. The last time I talked to you, you all had locked jaw. You refused to identify the racketeers who were robbing you and running your business for you. I'm giving you another chance now to prove that your men will stand up for your rights. John Butler stood up for his rights. Yes. And I'd rather be in his shoes than yours. You walked out and left him to face the job alone. At least we're here, Mr. Lindsay. It's doing what? Waiting around for hardening of the arteries. It's easy to talk, but I have a family to think of. And I tell you, there isn't anything to be afraid of. We have the head man, and his assistant, Moss Kitchell, was killed tonight. What good will that do? Someone else will take their places, organize a new gang? Not if we get all of them. That's why we can't afford to let any of them slip through our fingers. There they are, in there. All I want you to do is to identify them. Now, we've spent nearly a year gathering evidence against them. I know they're guilty, but I need your help to prove it. Now, will you help me? Have I risked the lives of 25 young lawyers for nothing? Why, they gave up their careers just to help you. I can fail. I won't fail just because you're a, you're a bunch of white-bellied jellyfish. Mr. Lindsay, we've been beaten up. Our homes have been bombed. Do you think we're going to cringe because of a few harsh words? Well, how can I make you realize just how serious this whole thing is? I'm not going to risk my future. Well, there is no future if you pay tribute to rackets. I'm not ashamed to say that I'm afraid. I'm a peaceful man. Violence terrifies me. I'd rather pay than be beaten. Even if we could face them, we have to protect our families. But how? Don't you realize that when you pay for protection, you're not only setting yourselves up, but your sons. Yes, and their sons, too. Gentlemen. I don't altogether agree with Mr. Lindsay that we have nothing to fear. But we do live here. We work here. And unless we do something to clear up this terrible situation and make our city a safer place to live in, we're worse than the men he's asking us to identify. Uh, of course you are. I'm ready. Come on, George. Good. I'm ready, too. We should have done this a small time ago. Where's my pal? I'm with you, Professor. Mason, line them up to one side. All right, men, line them up over here. Come on, you fellows, snap into it. Over on this side. Hurry up there. Mason, as these men are identified, I have them taken to the dining room. Gentlemen, I've turned my home into a rat trap for your convenience. Now, do any of these rodents look familiar to you? I know of this crook. I paid him money every week for protection he forced down my throat. That's the man who smashed my window. And that's the guy that came next morning to sell me plate glass insurance. That's the man who wrecked my laundry. He handled a strong arm squad in the poultry sure bank. Like this one was wrecking my milk traps That's until I started paying for protection. Back and then you come in with two other men and hit me up because I wouldn't pay them any more money. Too. Wait till I get them in court. This one held me and hit me like this. Here, here, now, take it easy, Mr. Higgins. That man drove a truck through the window of my store. Naming this balloon. Statement yeah. for the press? That's nice. Thank you. Hi, Professor. Hello, lady. What goes on here, revolution? Yeah, something like that. The way they're bringing men now, I'll have to get a ballpark for the overflow. In here, Frankie. I must apologize for asking you to come here at such a late hour. Well, that's all right. I'm used to it. Sit down, Frankie. You said you wanted me to meet somebody? Yes. You please. Miss Blue, I want you to meet Mr. Eugene Ferguson. How do you do? Sit down, Jean. 
Oh, uh, by the way, Jean, when I introduced you to Miss Blue, I neglected to mention just who she is. Among other things, she's the lady who killed Moss Kitchell. It isn't polite to contradict, but according to the extras they're yelling on the streets, Moss Kitchell committed suicide. Yes, yes, of course. But we know better, don't we? What do you want to see me about, John? Oh, yes, uh, we'd better get down to business. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. I have some very interesting film which I'd like to show you. And I think everything is in order. Stop pacing, Marsh. You make me nervous. Excitement, boss. You know I don't like to come here. You heard about this roundup, didn't you? Yes, what of it? They're not going to get me in it. I'm serving notice right now. I'm not holding the bag for anybody. You won't have to. I don't care what Lindsay's got on Gerard. He'll never be able to use it. You said that before, and he's still around. Even if you got Lindsay out of the way, what about your son? He probably knows as much as Lindsay does. Why didn't you get him out of there when I told you to? You're going to knock him off, too? What kind of a rat is he? <laughs> You shouldn't have said anything about Paul. It's dynamite. Well, maybe it's time to use a little dynamite. What are you going to do? Call Paul Ferguson. Cronin had the same idea. You know what happened to him. Hello, Paul Ferguson. This is Moss Kitchell. I know there's an order to pull me in. But if I'm pinched, you'll be the one that'll suffer most. If you want to know why, come around to my apartment and I'll tell you. Okay. I'll be here waiting. You're going to end up on the hot seat, unless I get what I want. What do you want? Well, I want you to write me a story, just the same as if you were still working for the press. Well, a story of my life? Yes. Beginning six years ago, when you left the paper and became involved in these rackets. Now, if I like your story, there's a bonus in it for you. What's the bonus? Your life. Of course, you'll have to stand trial for the killing of Moss Kitchell. But I'll see to it that the district attorney bears down easily. I'll guarantee you to save you from the chair if you'll give me a signed story that'll help bring convictions. What about him? I won't write a line if it'll send him to the chair. And I promise you it won't. You give him a break, too? Yes, but not on your account. I'm thinking of somebody else. Yes, I know. typewriter in here and plenty of copy paper. It's all right, kid. Go ahead. The story she's writing in there for tomorrow's paper? Well, that depends. You know, Gene, some of the best stories never get printed. Sit down. I want to talk to you about Paul. He's a fine boy, Gene. He's on the threshold of great things. My leave of absence will be over in a few days. I want to get back to my classes. I miss them. I'll be glad to have somebody like Paul take my place. I'm going to arrange with Barry to let Paul handle all the prosecutions. He can be the next district attorney. From then on, he has only one handicap. Me? Yes. And your money. 
Well, you've got an awful lot of it, Jean. Too much for Paul to inherit. Have you ever made out a will? No. Never got around to it. Well, I made one out for you. Read it. You'll see that I left only a fraction of your estate to Paul. What's this? A trust fund for a family of the name of Butler. Yes. I don't know whether you remember him or not, but he was one of my witnesses. He was killed before he could testify. He, I suppose, more than anybody else, was responsible for the success of this investigation. He left a wife and a couple of kids. I've been sending the money, but I think a trust fund would be more proper, don't you? The rest of the estate will go to a fund to carry on the work of this investigation. I can think of no better use to which your money could be put. This will is dated a month ago. Yes, I dictated it tonight, but I dated it back. It'll look better that way. I see I've appointed you executor. Well, would you rather have somebody else? No, I think not. I'll arrange about witnesses later. I think you better sign it now. You talk as if I were going to die pretty soon. We all die pretty soon. Yes. We do. Things I'd like to attend to before the fun begins. What? I'll be around when you want me. The way you'd want me. I'll trust you to do the right thing. Well, it's getting pretty late. I sent my chauffeur back. I don't suppose there are any cabs around this time in the morning. I wonder if you'd let me borrow your car. Like that? Well, yes. Yes, certainly. Here are the keys. Thank you. I hope Frankie's story will prove helpful. See, Lindsay, it's on the level, I tell you. They get the finger on him, and all the cops in the world can't stop it. Come along. John, this man says there's a plot to kill you before the night's over. What? It's true, Mr. Lindsay. I didn't want no part of it. They rigged up your car with a bomb. It's set to go off the minute you step on the starter. The bomb in my car? Paul. Somebody's been killed. Shut They'll hang up. me for this. Come Please, on. Mr. Lindsay, go hang Shut me up. for this. I Make think sure. Uh, give me a Shut break. Up. You. Take charge of this man. I want to talk to him later. What was that? Somebody planted a bomb in Professor Lindsay's car. Paul. Yes? It was your father. He just borrowed the keys to my car. You gave it to him. You sent him out of here to be killed. I didn't know anything about the car. You killed Eugene Ferguson. I tell you, I didn't know anything about it. But he did. And he had courage enough to die that way. He had to go out some way. We both knew that. I left it up to him. 
What could I do? Hound him to the chair, put him in jail for the rest of his life and let Paul... He did have courage, Paul. He just took the wrong direction. You keep on going, and you'll go a long way. I, I've got work to do, Professor. Thank you. John, it's all so horrible. It's all right, honey. It's all over. Professor, we sure dismiss you. How does it feel to be back, Professor? Right, well, Professor, it sure seems like old times to see you again. Do you again. think you can make a lawyer out of me? Well, I'll try. Thanks. Ah, the old school. Now it's great to be back, Jerry. Yes, after a nice, long, restful vacation. Yes, there's nothing like it. Now, now, don't you worry. We'll have that honeymoon yet. You just keep packing ready. We're going. Yes, when? Well, I'll have an sabbatical. But that's six years off. What, so soon as that? Oh, John. You know, it's complaining like this that breaks up the most successful marriages. John! Hmm? What's the matter? Oh, look. Huh? Oh. Well, you know, it's things like this that make the most successful marriages successful. 